right, is a topic. And so uh, it's a perfect topic for, for PBM. Is everybody already Are doing you? laser PBM? She's brand new to this environment. Okay. Two new right. people. Welcome. <laughs> Okay, arthritis is really probably the most uh, well-known condition to any clinic or any doctor or any, any therapist that uses photobiomodulation or PBM, I'll just refer to it as, or low-level laser therapy and so on. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's the number one reason in my office for people to come in for, for this kind of treatment. Arthritic knees is probably uh, the most common reason so far, knees, shoulders, um, hands and feet as well. I think you're probably having the same experience here, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, we do, especially this office has a pretty wide variety for pretty new offices. Uh, uh, there's quite a wide spectrum of, of conditions that have been, have been coming through the door and I've seen really complicated cases here, even using functional medicine approaches to complement this, this sort of thing. But and, and neuropathy and tendon tears, rotator cuff problems and things of that nature, bursitis for example, those are uh, a little more difficult to treat, not in terms of the technical aspects of treating it, but they're more difficult to predict, I should say. Um, I haven't had a failed case yet in uh, years using just handheld laser, then adding in the full body aspects, just sped the whole process way up. Um, so I use you know fewer visits and, and get better results in a shorter period of time. But it's still a little less predictable as far as how long it's gonna take. Um, arthritis is less, uh, it's more predictable. It's a, there's less uncertainty with people walking the door. I can say this too that's been very surprising to me that I don't have any research to, to back this up or bear this out, but um, age doesn't seem to matter when it comes to arthritic joints. I mean, it, it, maybe to temper that statement a little bit, it, it matters, but not nearly as much as I would have predicted. I have had patients in their early 90s get results just as quickly as people in their early 50s, uh, which has been a very surprising uh, situation for me. Doing soft tissue techniques and doing manipulative therapy, sort of old-fashioned chiropractic care and that sort of thing over the last 20 years, when age is always a huge factor. I mean, if somebody's coming in at 80 years old versus, say, 50 years old and they have arthritis, you could typically predict that the level of arthritic change will be commensurate to the date on their birth certificate. I mean, it's an almost you know, ubiquitous statement. And practically always, from a traditional rehabilitation model, physical therapy, chiropractic type of treatment, you know, the age is one of the greatest factors in predicting how much treatment that I would think that a person would need. Uh, if a you know, 20 year difference in age from two different patients to come in with the same complaints, let's say arthritic knees, let's say, uh, typically that extra 20 years would add at least an extra eight weeks of, of treatment. So I would lay out a treatment plan predicting a much longer course of care. Photobiomodulation has not been, it's not borne out that way. Uh, where every day I see people that are in their mid 80s, I only have a few patients that are in their early 90s, but they've recovered very quickly. And in many cases, the people in their 80s have recovered even faster than the people in their 50s and 60s. I have a theory as to why that might be, and I don't, again, I don't have any evidence for this, but it's my own perception, uh, maybe it'll be borne out, that uh, part of the reason that people that are further along in years get better is, um, and I know this is true for some of them, they have a little less muscle density. There's a little less muscle mass. Most of us lose our muscle, our muscle mass as we get older. And I think that's part of the reason is that the photons are able to penetrate through the tissues with, with greater ease. I don't know if that's true or not. But when it comes to the knees, I don't think that's even a factor because we don't have any lean muscle tissue around our knees. And I think that's why the knees are the most, uh, have been the most successful joints treated. Uh, consistently in my office, and I think in this one too, you probably haven't had a failed case of arthritic knees. Um, I haven't yet at any age. Part of that, I think, is because of the ease of access. You know, if you were to make an incision there into the skin, I mean, the, the joint's right there. And so there's less deep, less soft tissue to penetrate, less scatter from the, the photons, from the photobiomodulation, and so you can get a really consistent delivery. The beautiful thing, and, and, and so you haven't seen this before, any other prior talks, but one of the things that we talked about in the very initial uh, the initial seminars or, or talks on photobiomodulation, we showed research to explain how it works on a cellular level. And ultimately, if you can deliver you know, photons, if you can deliver the, the infrared and near infrared light to any tissue that's still got some life in it, you're going to have, an, you're going to activate a repair mechanism in that tissue. So even people that have pretty advanced arthritic change, uh, if they have some cartilage left, let's say in the knees, the shoulders, the hips, hands and feet, 
uh, if there's anything viable left, it's going to respond to the therapy. And age, again, in, this, in that situation, doesn't seem to really be a major factor. Um, some of the things we'll talk about, too, because there's, there's sort of a combination when we're talking about arthritis. We could just talk about photobiomodulation, and it works very well. But we could also just talk about nutrition, simple stuff, that we'll just cover kind of the, the, the main aspects. And that works very well. But when you put the two together, it's outrageously good. I mean, it's a it's a kind of an unbeatable combination, at least right now. We're seeing the advent of things like stem cell therapies and PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma injections into joints. That falls under the auspices of regenerative medicine. And those things work very well. They're great. But even the people that I know that, that are in that industry, some orthopedists, the, the results are even better when they combine that with these simple things we're going to talk about tonight, including photobiomodulation. So whatever, whatever you're going to do, even in the future, to regenerate tissue, there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be uh, a major part of it, even once we have sort of mainstream stem cell, mesenchymal stem cell therapies, and so on. So I'll show you some of the, just a, a small selection of some of the research out there that are from major journals. You know, these aren't newspaper articles or popular press. This is all peer-reviewed literature to show you that, you know, that um, it's not theory, that none of this is sort of, that it's hypothetical. Some of these things have been around now for a very long time, including photobiomodulation. I think from the earliest days that it's been used, uh, even in veterinarian medicine, before it was approved for human use, I mean, it was hip dysplasia, arthritis in joints, like arth disc issues in the spine of dogs, cats, horses. Uh, inflammation in the shoulders and tendonitis and things like that. Veterinarians still, I have two veterinarians in my, uh, where my clinic is, uh, and they've been doing photobiomodulation longer than anybody in that area because it it's been used for animals longer than people, which is one of the things that I found most compelling because there's no placebo effect, right? I mean, if you're treating a dog with an arthritic hip uh, and it's quickly not limping around and can leap up onto the, to the chair, the couch again, that's not placebo. The dog doesn't have any idea what's going on. And so we do have placebo-controlled trials. I think one or two of them are in my slides for tonight, so you'll get an example of that as well. But laser is really easy to do placebo with, right? I mean, it's just a red light then. You know, you can just literally shine a, have a wand that has nothing but red light emitted, and the, the person being treated can't feel a difference, you know, because unless you're using really high-powered lasers to generate a lot of heat, which is actually a lot of sort of criticism now clinically, uh, the, the best and the most effective lasers for repair are like the, the one that we have here where you can hold it in place for a sustained period of time, like a minute or more, without burning the tissue. Right? You don't have to paintbrush back and forth over the tissue so you can have a sustained contact with the tissues that you're trying to treat. And we see that to be more effective, especially for the repair, kind of to trigger that healing response. But you can't tell if it's just a red light on your tennis elbow. Uh, versus the actual laser or LED cluster, you can't really tell the difference. It looks the same. You can't feel it happening. The effects are delayed. Most people, after they have treatment like that, feel the effects the next day. You know, sometimes later that evening, but mostly it's the next day, especially with plantar fasciitis and tendonitis and things like that. So it's very easy to do placebo control. There are a multitude of studies out there already to show that placebo has no benefit and the, the laser has total benefit or a very, very high success rate. So arthritis is, is a perfect topic to talk about when we're, we're talking about the best practices or best uses of things like photobiomodulation because the success rate is very high. I've been telling patients in my office now for a while, like when, when I, especially if I have some films or a lot of times they, people come in, they've already had an MRI or something, right? Sometimes they're contemplating surgery. And if it's not, if the, let's say it's a knee again, if the cartilage isn't completely obliterated, like if it's not bone on bone, like that gets thrown around a lot, but sometimes when you look at the radiology report, it's not really, you know, there's, there's not much left, but there's some cartilage left. And what I confidently tell people now that I've been doing it for years is that it's not really a matter of if they're gonna get better, it's just when, you know I mean? And that's, and typically I can give them a pretty good estimate of time, like how often, for how long, before we should see something happen. But in reality, it's been my experience and I've been able to experiment with a lot of people, uh, thousands of people now, over a long period of time, and when there's the tissues are still viable, it's just a really if, um, how long is it going to take? So some people are so sort of desperate and, and highly motivated to avoid surgery, let's say a knee replacement, or especially spinal surgery. If people are looking at disc surgeries and so on. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have a great amount of trepidation with that, and for good reason. And if there is a legitimate option, sometimes I tell folks, look, it might even take, what if it took 100 visits? 
I mean, because I don't know how long it's gonna, I think this is a really difficult case, it's very severe, there's not much left there to work with in terms of the cartilage and the joints, but I'll tell some folks, what if we had to do this twice a week for the next 50 weeks, right? But it worked, what if it did that? And a lot of people are of the mindset, well, that'd be awesome, let's go, right? Let's go ahead and start. Because in, the, in reality, in the early days of this, when I started doing this, because most people get such fast results, I started to lose confidence after two weeks. Right? If I saw someone two to three times a week for the first two or three weeks, if they weren't taking off, then I was, start, I was now starting to think, wow, I don't think this is gonna work. Which, after now doing it for a very long period of time, has changed. I think you went through that a lot too, where I was getting messages from Kelly after one or two weeks saying, you know, this person's no better yet. You know, and it's, but you know, that's because most people do get better that fast, right? I mean, you normally see that, so it's always concerning when we don't see this instant takeoff of just a few visits. And I still feel it to this day, but I've done it enough now with enough people that I know if those tissues are viable and I know that I'm hitting the target, you know, I know that if you, if you do it enough, it's going to work out. And, and that's a, a sort of a long intro, but that's a good preface to we're getting into this, this topic of arthritis. You know, break that down a little bit, what that really is. But we're talking about degeneration of joints, right? And a lot of people, and just to clarify that term, arth means joint, right? That's, and so arthropathy and, and arthritis, it's, it's, arthropathy just refers to that active degenerative change. Let's say it was these discs in the spine or these facet joints back here. I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like but you can see those things breaking down on a, on a regular old x-ray and you can really see it in great detail on MRI or, or a CT scan. But itis just means inflammation, right? So arthritis technically just means inflammation in a joint. So by that definition, even if I just say I sprained my ankle on the way here tonight and it was inflamed, well, technically I currently have arthritis in that ankle, meaning it's inflamed at the moment. But when we talk about arthritis, whether it's doctors talking to patients or just people using the word, we typically are referring to degenerative changes in the joint. So there is inflammation that's been hanging around for so long that the joint is now breaking down. And as a general rule in physiology, you can think of it that way, that inflammation that hangs around will destroy stuff, right? It's just an, as a simple, it's a rule. Inflammation that hangs around any part of the body for a long period of time will destroy the tissue that's inflamed in that area, whether that's musculature, tendons, ligaments, etc., cetera, or, or cartilaginous structures. So, the idea for the best practice to, to sort of intercede in that process is to snuff out the inflammatory response first, right? Which makes sense. So on joints that are, say, shallow, like say my, my hands, you know, or my, my ankle, let's say I sprained the ankle as I mentioned, well, there's not a lot of deep tissue there, so if that ligament, say I rolled it to the outside, I sprained the ligament on the outside, it's called lateral collateral ligament, I can put an ice pack on that, right, and attenuate the inflammatory response because I can literally change the temperature of that ligament because it's right under the mm -hmm. skin. And that's okay to at least t attenuate that sort of inflammatory response. Maybe I can shorten the duration of the pain. I can numb some of the pain. It's not actively repairing it though. And, that, and that's the big difference to understand between photobiomodulation versus say icing it, right? Or even applying Voltaren gel, you know, topical non steroidal anti-inflammatory, or for that matter, popping anti-inflammatories. If you have an injury like that, the first 48 hours, there's a lot of clinical benefit to taking something like ibuprofen, let's say, or naproxen. Beyond that 48 hours, uh, you know, the, the benefits start to drop tremendously. And then beyond a week or two, the side effects start to go up tremendously, right? There's a lot of negative impact. The difference between all of that stuff is whether it's an ice pack or if it's, you know, non steroidal anti-inflammatories internally or topically, None of that does anything to repair the tissue, right? It doesn't positively impact the speed of repair. It can attenuate your pain, you know, icing it, elevating it, resting it. That might shorten the duration of, your, of the acute pain. It will actually, but the length of time that it's going to take for your tissues to heal is going to be the same. Photobiomodulation is the one exception to that. It does shorten the, the length of time that it's going to take to recover from an acute injury like that. And at the same time, if you have arthritic joints, so from now on, when I say arthritis tonight, we're, we're talking about degeneration, right? Joint degenerative change. If you are in that process of, to, of joint degenerative change, whether it's spinal joints, hip joints, knee joints, etc., cetera, if, if you don't do anything to snuff out that ongoing inflammatory response, it's going to keep on rolling, right? So you could take non steroidal anti-inflammatories, but that's not going to localize. Let's say that you had uh, arthritic changes, again, just let's say it's the knees, right? Uh, those are su such common arthritic joints, <laughs> knees and hips and so on, shoulders. Let's say that I had arthritis in my knees 
And so I start to, you know, you listen to the commercials, right? You know, Bob, the UPS driver commercial, one all day long, all day strong, those ridiculous things. So this guy's taking one a day and it sort of leads you to believe that, you know, it must be safe. They sell it over the counter. You don't need a prescription. And then you see uh, studies that show, for example, you know, even that one a day non-steroidal over a period of time accelerates the degenerative changes in the joints, right? So you're covering up the pain and you're speeding up the process of degeneration, which is just nuts. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to do that, especially if there are better alternatives. Then you see really scary stuff, like the Harvard Nurses Health Study, you know, there's 116,000 women, uh, you know, looking at tracking 116,000 women over, over five years, and women that took one ibuprofen a day increased breast cancer risk by 51%. So women who took one aspirin a day increased breast cancer risk by 81%. I mean, these are pretty important things to understand, right? But they don't mention that on those commercials and people don't generally know about that. And so they go about their day taking stuff. This is worth mentioning in the context of this kind of talk because, you know, when I, I look at that sort of, I try to look at big picture all the time. So people are coming in with arthritic joints and I can alter their course using photobiomodulation. That's a really big deal. It's great to enhance their quality of life, to get rid of pain, right? but you're not just covering it up with photobiomodulation. It's not like taking those pills. When the pain gets better, or even ideally goes away, it's because you've actually corrected it at the level of the joint. That's a big deal, right? There's not, it's not analgesia, it's not covering up stuff. When that pain goes away, it's because that inflammatory response is gone, again, using the knees as an example, and people will hear it and they feel it, like they don't crack and pop as much, they can go up and down stairs without as much crackling and popping, they don't have the pain that they had. These are great things. And so again, you know, there's a huge, it's a complete uh, and total difference between everything else that's out there, which is anti-inflammatory drugs, really, and then maybe some ice applications and things like that. But that's still the standard of care. And there is a world of difference between doing that, which inevitably leads to bad outcomes, right? Like the UPS guy in the commercial taking his one a day leave is gonna have a heart attack or a stroke as a consequence of that, guaranteed. Right? Like there's no, no, you can't do it and get away with it, you know, certainly for years. And so whether it's women having breast cancer as a consequence, we don't know what happens to men because that study was on women. People think that prostate cancer is probably similar in its response. But, you know, women are, men are getting away scot-free, I can guarantee that. And we know that any non steroidal anti-inflammatories, whether it's ibuprofen, naproxen, etc., when you do that, there's compensations and things called leukotrienes that go up and it raises your risk of heart attacks and strokes causes cardiovascular disease. And along the way, it can wreck your gut, and damage your liver, you know. So it's sort of like you're training in arthritis pain for these things, you know, that's uh, not a good trade-off, right? So, so just summarizing all of that, photobiomodulation has zero risk, right? There's no contraindications, anyone can do it, no matter what medication they're on, even if they're on blood thinners, uh, they can do it if they have a pacemaker, if they can do it if they have, have rods in their spine or any kind of, you know, neural stimulator zero risk, which is one of the greatest things. I think the second greatest thing about it is the fact that it has zero risk. I think the greatest thing about it is it always works, right? It, it always is going to do what it's supposed to do. When I consider cases that are very rare, but when, when I consider like a failed case, it's that we didn't achieve the clinical result we wanted. Let's say a person comes in with major arthritis in their knees, there's still cartilage that's viable in there, you know, they're not an absolute knee replacement yet, and they're trying to stop or slow that process down. Well, our goal is to get rid of all the pain in their knees, right? And sometimes we tell people right at the outset, that's still the goal, we wanna shoot for that, but you know, this is pretty severe, so I think what I can, you know, really, what I, if I was betting on it, I'd bet that we get at least 50%, let's say, improvement. And a lot of people would be thrilled with that, right? Like they'll be doing cartwheels over 50% because they're in such degree of pain. But we're always shooting for 100%, but I would still consider that like, a, like a, not a complete success because with every case we're looking at total recovery, total relief. So that's kind of just sort of a way to frame it as we, as we kind of look at some of the specifics. So there are phases of degeneration, and I'm just gonna get some sort of like a little bit of a housekeeping just for terminology out of the way. So I'm using, a, you know, these are just a, a spine as an example, but we could use any joint, right? I could show a series of knees there and just show that progression. But it doesn't really matter. In this case, we're looking at discs. So the discs between the vertebra are made of fibrocartilage, right? Whereas in your knees, your meniscus and so on is hyaline cartilage, same in the shoulders and the hips and other things. But the process is the same. And, and all this is just showing is that you start to get kind of these rough edges 
around the joints. You can really see them here. Those are the spurs that you hear about or read about or see on your own films or your reports. And you can just see this process where you're getting thinning of the disc material. And again, this could be knees or shoulders where you get thinning of the cartilage. And then you see this spurring form around the edges of the joints. The problem when it's the spine is that you get these spurs that crop back out there where those nerve roots are exiting. And that's a pretty wicked situation to be in. Uh, <clears throat> when you hear people talking about a pinched nerve, for example, that's usually what they're talking about. In our case here, if what's, do, if what's putting the pressure on the nerve is the disc material, then we have a very good shot at recovery there using the, the photobiomodulation, particularly using the, the laser and targeting it right at that. You can get that disc to shrink a bit, but you can activate repair processes in that tissue. And you can kind of use even the laser for an analgesic effect in the short term so you can get rid of the pain while you're waiting for the healing to take place. So one of the beautiful things about the laser that we have here actually is you can do both of those things. You can do pain relief, faster pain relief, and then you can turn around and do healing. You know, so you can try to numb the pain or block the pain, and then you can still treat to accelerate the repair, so you're not just covering stuff up. But it goes in those phases. So you typically have phase one with some thinning, phase two, more thinning with a little rough edges, phase three, you know, where you've got now spurs, and that could be any of those joints that we're talking about, and it looks like that. There's the knee. So, Osteoarthritis is still used a lot. It's, there's nothing wrong with that term, but it's kind of an old, just point out, it's an older term. Um, technically, in the medical literature, they, they just call it degenerative joint disease. But oftentimes, when <coughs> doctors are explaining to their patients, they don't want to use the word disease. <laughs> it's because it conjures up, you know, sort of other, you know, sort of scary pathologies and so on, and you think of it as a systemic illness. But it's a disease of the joint, right? A disease of the cartilage in this case, and the, and the joint itself. But degenerative joint disease is the same thing as osteoarthritis. Just to take that a step further for clarification, the difference between osteoarthritis, or DJD, degenerative joint disease, and rheumatoid arthritis is that in both cases, the joints are degenerating away. But in an osteoarthritis, it's more uh, associated with wear and tear, right? Sort of aging. As we get older, we, uh, you know, the demands of, of living and moving around uh, are outstripped or outpaced by our ability to repair. So as degeneration kind of outpaces repair, we start to accumulate these, these changes in terms of degeneration. So osteoarthritis is wear and tear, you can think of it as that, um, and rheumatoid arthritis is degeneration of a joint as a consequence of the immune system attacking that joint. So the immune system, that's autoimmune, is your immune system's attacking you. So rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and there are a bunch of them, right? Like psoriatic arthritis is reasonably common, ankylosing spondylitis, I think I have one study on that in here, which is a terrible uh, arthritic disease of the spine, where it looks like the spine is literally like candle wax dripping down, and, you know, on an x-ray, it looks like the spine is kind of melting. And it gets, turns into an inflexible, it feels like, like a piece of bamboo, and it even looks like that on film. Uh, photobiomodulation is the only thing that I've ever heard of that I can actually intercede in that. I, I have that study in here tonight. But again, you can get the idea here. That nice smooth looking cartilage, you know, you've all seen the end of a, say, a chicken drumstick, you know, that, that white slippery solid cartilage, that's hyaline cartilage. It's the same cartilage that you have in your knee. If you were to look at a human knee, it looks just like that. That cartilage feels like that. Should be super slippery, least amount of friction. You've got these pads built in here, so this would be the inside of the knee, that's the medial meniscus, and then you have the lateral. So the meniscus, or the menisci, the plural, they're just like these little, almost like you know, bean-shaped sort of cushions that are in there, so that's what pads the joint when you, when you stand up or when you're walking. We put more weight on the inside of the joint than we do on the outside when it comes to the knee, so usually you'll see this one degenerating first. You know, if you look at x-rays, you'll see the thinning on that inner portion before you see it on the outer. But you can see the defects formed in the cartilage. There's a bunch of gouges, you know, it sort of looks like the surface of the moon. You know, on some of these images, when you look, they, it looks like these, they have these cratered uh, kind of lesions on the cartilage. It's degenerating and your body can't keep up with, this, uh, with the pace of repair. So I'll repeat this a bunch of times because it's kind of the central theme for photobiomodulation, PBM. But remember, that's the big thing about PBM is it activates repair mechanisms. You know, just to, before we go through the rest of this, to remind some of you, and then for those who haven't heard it before, in the, when I do just a general talk about PBM, I always show the study or two on wound healing and diabetics, and, and people that have advanced diabetes would say wounds on their feet that won't heal. 
the reason I always use that is that's that's when you if you really think about it, that's the most profound thing, you know, to, to think about. It, it's like if I if I tied a tourniquet on my arm up here and I just left it there, right? And if I came back here tomorrow night, my arm and hand are not gonna be feeling too good, right? Let's say I come back on the weekend and now I've got, you know, you can see discoloration changes taking place in my hand. And imagine that I just, I cut, I put a cut on the palm of my hand. It's not gonna heal in that situation, right? If I took the tourniquet off, restored normal blood perfusion to the tissue, it would heal. But the, the real mind bender for me with PBM has always been, I could keep the tourniquet on, have the wound, shine the laser on it, and it will heal. You know, even with the tourniquet on. That's what that means when you're looking at diabetic wounds, if you think about that. Why won't the wound heal in that person, right? If they have pretty advanced diabetes, they go to the beach, step on something, create it, what is, starts off as a very minor wound on the bottom of their foot, but it doesn't heal. Why? Because they have compromised circulation into their feet, right? Or at least that foot. Usually it's symmetrical. And th that's because you've got that small vessel damage, you know, that's the, the fed down into, into the lower limbs. And, and you'll, they'll get stocking glove syndrome, right? If it gets advanced enough, meaning hands and feet go numb. They have numbness in a stocking and glove kind of pattern. So that wound that won't heal just continues to fester and get worse. And of course, the first line of defense typically is hyperbaric oxygen, right? Where you're getting into a chamber or they'll mm -hmm. give you a hyperbaric oxygen boot in this case and you're increasing the atmosphere's atmospheric pressure to drive more oxygen perfusion into the tissues. And it's got, I don't know, about a 50% success rate or something. It's decent, right? But it's expensive and it doesn't always work. Whereas in nearly every case, every, in every case I've ever seen, but it's, it's well over 90% success, you can use the laser, shine that on there, and you do that every day for a couple, two, three, four minutes a day, and you will see in almost every case those wounds will, will close up. So again, it's just like having the tourniquet on, right? Or in this case, I could put it on my leg. But the same thing holds true is that you still have compromised oxygen and nutrient perfusion. Now, part of the reason that it works is because it enhances the blood perfusion into the tissue. Um, and you, Kelly's got great photos actually before and after of a particular person here that was 75 or something, 74 years old, really severe case of neuropathy. And you know she has pictures of his feet and they're reddish, purple kind of, right? Like kind of a dark, kind of a purpley red. He has fungal infections in his nails because of compromised uh, blood perfusion. And in seven or eight visits or something like that, that first photo? There's one. Yeah. Seven, and then yeah. we now have it updated to 10. Yeah. And they look and still, totally normal. Yeah, and so as little as seven treatments, uh, that'd be probably two to three minutes a foot, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Like probably three minutes a foot. And like to think of that, how fast that change can take place. And the before and after photos are really striking, is that like they, they return to normal color. And of course his pain was completely gone, you know, and this is a pretty severe case of neuropathy and burning, stinging pain in the feet. How does that work? Well, again, improved blood perfusion, improved circulation is the reason for the color change. For that to even have happened, then the microvasculature, those tiny vessels, had to have opened up and improved, right? It's like you sort of like you got the drain open, the clogged drain, right? You're just letting everything go through. And that's what photobiomodulation could do, which is, again, almost you know, miraculous to me that it can do that. So when you apply that same thing here, imagine if that's your knee, right? You're not going to get it to look like that again, at least not that I've ever heard ever seen. I mean, that would be ideal. But you can get it to look more like that. And that's the point, right? Is that even with advanced age, even with compromised ability to recover and repair and even compromised circulation, hands, feet, and so on, you can still move it along the spectrum back towards that. There's nothing else that can do that at this point in time. And so it's not gonna thicken up these meniscus, the, the meniscus isn't gonna puff up like you're 18 again, you know, but it can patch the cracks and it can halt that process, that onward march of degenerative change. And there's a ton of value in that obviously, is that because of course your quality of life gets better because your pain goes down or hopefully goes all the way away. Um, but even beyond that, you kind of get the peace of mind knowing that you've just pulled the brakes on this process. So at the very least, you know, you're going to buy yourself years of time before something major has to be done, like cutting off the whole joint and putting a new one in, right? And to replace parts like that is much better than it used to be. The surgery's come a long way, technology's better that way too, but it's still a big deal, right? And you probably want to keep your original parts if you can. I mean, most people would rather. And the other thing is on that note is that, you know, I've had some of the greatest success cases in my office that were post-surgical anyway. People have got the replacement done 
and then they typically have pain around the, the surgical site, you get inflammation of peripheral nerves and so on, and then photobiomodulation still comes in that way. I mean, in my opinion, based on my clinical experience, but also the evidence that's out there is, after any of those, a hip, a knee, a shoulder replacement, a rotator cuff surgery, certainly spinal surgeries, automatically it should be standard of care. People should be doing pre-surgical and post-surgical photobiomodulation treatment. And I've seen it over and over and over again for years now that the, the outcomes are far superior. My own, yeah, go ahead. Would that be whole body or targeted? Or I do both. both. I always do both now, especially in those cases. Mm -hmm. Because the one big benefit to the whole body is that you do get that stem cell elevation from your shins and your sternum. And it may be even from other long bones, but we don't know right now. But something is totally different when you add that in. Because I'd done it for a long time before I, we even ever had full body applications. And then as soon as I had the full body application in conjunction, the results went through the roof. Mm. Not only for like the, the percentage rate of success, but the speed. You know, it got a lot faster. But, and again, I, I look back and I think of, and I've even you know, had some of those people like some of my longtime patients that had sort of lackluster results with my handheld laser. And after I got the full body and I started to see that, I got, I got those people to come back in and do it again. And this time they were combining the two and they had total success. So I really wonder how many people in my early days of doing this did I cut loose because I was too premature in my, you know, my negative thinking. I just, you know, because it was, especially in the early days, uh, when, when there's not a lot to guide you, you know, sort of as an, I was an early adopter in terms of that technology, you know, I hated to have somebody, I didn't want to tell someone just to keep on going if they were inevitably going to fail anyway. But where I really learned a lot was when I had a group of people, I had, I had some fairly sizable groups of people, like 40 people in one group, 50 people in another, go through um, really long treatment, 36 visits, and I had large groups going for three times a week, uh, for 12 weeks. I had a large group of 40 go two times a week for 18 weeks. Uh, and then I've even had people go once a week for six months. And, uh, and so I learned a lot from that. And that's where I started becoming more confident telling people, if you do this long enough, you're gonna get there. Mm -hmm. And just to frame it, sometimes that's why I'll use that, analogy, that, that example for people and say, just to sort of lay it right out and say, what if it took 50 times? Or what if it took 100 times? You know, would it be worth it to you, you know, in that scenario? And you got to think of it that way in some of those cases where they're really severe cases. Because I have a lot of people coming in now with such severe cases, they're not going to get better in the first two or three months, right? I can tell them that right off the bat. Or sometimes you always get those miracle cases or those surprisingly good cases. Even that fellow with the neuropathy, that's uncharacteristically fast. You know, I think like I've seen those kinds of cases succeed like that, but that would normally be more like 20 to 30, not seven. Yeah, so that was, you know, but those are always great when you get those kind of pleasant surprises. Um, but in all these cases, especially post-surgical stuff, I always use the combination of the whole body plus the local application. My mother, for example, came down, with, she had to have a knee replaced, and it was totally bone on bone. There was no viable tissue there. But even in cases like that, it's kind of remarkable that, you know, she came down for 20 days, and so I treated her every other day, so 10 times over 20 days. And even going home for surgery, there's no pain. You know, you still need the surgery because it's going to come back. There's nothing there. It's like bone grinding on bone, but the pain still went away. Yeah, that's pretty. And then also, she recovered without any prescription drugs for pain. So after a full knee replacement, she took Motrin for the first five days, and that's all she used, and that was it. No prescription. And she went. She zoomed through her physical therapy or post-surgical rehab really quickly. And even her physical therapist was, was commenting constantly at the time, like, I don't know how you're doing this. You know, you're going through these leg presses and all these other things, not on painkillers, and, you know, going faster than people that were many, many, many years younger than her. So that's not coincidence. I've seen that with many of my other patients and that sort of thing, too. So that, that pre and post treatment thing is, is pretty huge. So that's just another picture. I think you get the idea there where you can also see you know, the meniscus, you know, they're, they're, the nice and thick pillowy structures are getting thin. You can see this sort of bleeding down into the bone. They call it subchondral. Chondro is just cartilage. And what happens is you get cracks in the cartilage and then the fluid that's kept within that joint can start to seep through. And when it touches bone underneath that cartilage, you'll have this reaction. So on an x-ray, it's bright white. They call subchondral sclerosis, just evidence of pretty se severe arthritic change. So we try to use that to guide as well. Like if, if somebody has, the more extensive that is, we're gonna tell people that, you know, 
this is gonna, you know, you wanna at least be prepared for a longer journey here. Hopefully it's not, but you gotta be prepared for that. And that's that same sort of thing that I've been, like I said, I said, I tell people, you know, even if it took 100 visits, which I, by the way, I've never done. I've never had anybody go through that, but that's kind of how I have to frame it to some folks when they're thinking in terms of months, not weeks, you know, because this is sort of, um, it's, a, it's their only shot anyways, right? So if it's like if they can put up with it, say it's a disc herniation, they can put up with it for long enough, you know, they're, they're almost, you know, there's never a guarantee, but they're very, very likely to get to the finish line. So a couple things here, I'm just gonna, I'm, we're not gonna get into all this, this minutia, but the role of cytokines in osteoarthritis pathophysiology, as from 2002, um, all, all I wanted to mention about that is, I'm gonna use that term, and uh, cytokines are signaling molecules. And you have pro-inflammatory cytokines that, that sort of signal the need for inflammation. And you have anti-inflammatory cytokines that are that's supposed to kind of call an end to the inflammatory response. So the thing to know about that is just that it's all about inhibiting those cytokines, right? So therapies that could do that. So let's say it's an arthritic knee. I beam the laser through there. I get the stem cell stuff from the full body, shins and sternum, and that goes to repair whatever needs repairing. But you know, the photobiomodulation will help to quell, like it'll inhibit those cytokines, those inflammatory cytokines within the joint itself. And the studies bear that out. So I mean, that's just to, just to kind of clarify some terminology. So IL-1 is interleukin-1, TNF-alpha is tumor necrosis factor alpha. Um, those are like, those are the two, and there's interleukin-6 as well, but those are, these are the two most powerful pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so if this is, there, one of the lines from the study is that those cytokines drive the degenerative changes in the cartilage of the joints in osteoarthritis and prevent the cartilage cells from being able to halt the progression. So if you think about that, anything you can do to inhibit those cytokines will halt that progression. Now, from a pharmacological standpoint, you could say, well, that's what the Motrin and Naproxen, that's what those things are, steroids, cortisone, prednisone, they suppress those cytokines. But the problem with that is, is your body will adapt. So again, we've got those side effects downstream, right? Like cardiovascular uh, disease, and you can accelerate the further breakdown because it interferes with the normal uh, restructuring of the cartilaginous matrix. So it's sort of like aside from the cytokine level, the drugs kind of interfere with the recovery process. But the name of the game is to suppress that stuff. Um, so there's just a few things we're gonna talk about nutritionally, and then we'll kind of show you some stuff on PBM, then I'll wrap it up and explain how it all works. But this is a 2016 article, Efficacy and Tolerability of Undenatured Type 2 Collagen Supplement in Modulating Knee Osteoarthritis Symptoms. So I use these because they're multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. That is the gold standard in medicine, right, in medical research. Double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trials. That's kind of like if you have, if you have those and you can bear out a point, I mean, that's, that is the gold standard. And so UC2 is how it's referred to, undenatured type 2 collagen. You've probably all heard of glucosamine and chondroitin, right? Mm -hmm. You've seen the commercials, maybe some of you have even used it. Well, I've used glucosamine, chondroitin, and MSM for years and years and years. I mean, since I started in 1998. But several years ago, I got rid of that. I don't carry that in my office anymore because of UC2. I'll, I'll show you, I think there's a study coming up here that just even directly compares them, uh, even with arthritic horses, which again, no placebo, right? So that's why I like those studies. But you can look at uh, glucosamine chondroitin are great, they work. You know, there's no side effects. It's been, it's been around for a long time. Millions and millions of people have been using it for years. But type two collagen works better. And the beauty about type two collagen is that you only have to take it once a day. Whereas glucosamine and chondroitin really needs to be taken in three separate doses throughout the day, like typically 500 milligrams three times a day. And that's not that great because people always forget, usually the midday dose, but typically they'll forget one dose a day. Well, now you're gonna, you're gonna have no results in many cases, right? The difference between actual results and none at all is very dose dependent, where taking something once a day, one capsule a day, for example, the compliance is very high. Most people never forget to take one thing a day, right? They have their routine. Um, but this is what they show, conclusion, the type two collagen improved knee joint symptoms in osteoarthritis subjects as well, and it was well tolerated. There are no harmful side effects. Additional studies that elucidate the mechanisms for this actions are warranted. So that's 2016, and that's still an ongoing thing. Um, that was 191 volunteers, randomized placebo and treatment groups, uh, and then they took 40 milligrams type two collagen for 180 days. That's worth pointing out too. This isn't like it happens overnight, right? I always tell people in my office when they're gonna start taking that, not to judge it for at least the first 60 days. 
Some people will come back in a month and say, this is like the best thing ever, but lots of people don't notice anything until the second or third month. And so I always tell people to at least give it that, but I'd prefer that they do what they're doing here is more like a six month trial. And so it improved knee joint symptoms and osteoarthritis and it's well tolerated. Um, what, you, what is, is yeah. that uh, supplement, what are you asking for when you're buying it or whatever? What well, is, here it's joint complex. That's okay. the only one that we have, right? From uh, peer, peer encapsulations, I think you mm -hmm. have the joint complex. So that's why I use that company for that supplement because of all the companies that I deal with, that supplement is, and, and you'll see as we go through this, I'll just kind of run through these. It has all of these key ingredients. And they also, if you look at that label, they use Mariva, which is a patented curcumin formula. And I'll show a study on that. They use 5-Loxin, which is a patented uh, Boswellia uh, extract. And we'll see that. They use the UC2, which is the, the patented undead nature type two collagen. They have MSM in there as well. And you'll see a study on that. It's all in that, and it's in that one capsule, and they really do it for an extraordinarily low price. Uh, I've never seen any of the other professional grade formulas, like Metagenics has something similar to that, but it's like twice as expensive. And so that, uh, that joint complex is huge. And so I've been using, I got rid of all my glucosamine, MSM, chondroitin, and other related supplements. All of them have been replaced by that one. So that's why, that's why we, got that one or got hooked up with that company for this because I use that a lot. I mean, anybody who has any arthritic changes should take that. I mean, that's, that's what I send home to my parents and grandparents, my brother. Uh, you know, I take that one now myself. I don't have any symptoms at all, but I'm in my mid forties. And so I'll, you know, I take it a few times a week. And as I get older, I'll take it every day unless something bad comes along, but there's no side effects. You got a whole litany of side benefits actually, uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease, dementia prevention, you know, reduced uh, risk of things like type 2 diabetes, you get better insulin sensitivity. Um, there's a whole bunch of side benefits, and uh, that's one of my favorite supplements of all time, actually. So, and that's, that's all I'm doing here is just breaking down to show you some of that evidence behind each of those ingredients, and then I'll actually show that supplement. So, uh, this is 2015, uh, Nutritional Approach for Relief of Joint Discomfort. This is a 12-week open case series. Um, I think I've got the conclusion and coming in again. Yes, undenatured type two collagen has been found to be effective in clinical studies in rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. And this is why I say it's one of the most popular supplements I've ever used. I probably use that one on, like there are only a few things that I use on almost everyone from say 35 and up, uh, especially 40 and up, because we all start to accumulate degenerative changes, right? And at 35, you start to accumulate it more on the cellular level and the earliest I've ever seen arthritic changes on an x-ray, for example, would be at 35 would be like the youngest person, I mean, with, with rare exceptions, from an osteoarthritis standpoint. So 12 weeks of that uh, resulted in pain reduction in 100% of the 17 adults participating. And you don't see that very often in any, subs, in any research on humans, right? 100% that every person got better. You know, some people 100% better, some people 50%, but everybody improves. And I've seen that in my own office through all these years. I mean, when people do that stuff, I don't think I've ever seen anyone come back and say I'm no better. You know, it's kind of like, are you 50% or are you 100% or where in between? Because everybody gets better. But the point is too, in the context of this situation is, I've been using this stuff for 20 years, but I've only, you know, in the last few years when I've been combining that with photobiomodulation, it's a whole different ballgame. You know, it's a whole different story. And even the people who would have taken three, four or five months before to see changes on that, joint complex, now bless you. Now it's more like one to two months. And that's why I'm telling them now, just give it at least 60 days. Because if they're doing that combination, I fully expect massive changes in 60 days. Whereas before, it would have been more like, do it for six months before you decide on whether or not it's, you know, how much it's helping you. And then a lot of people too, which is common, they'll say, I don't know, it's somewhat better. And I'll say, well, let it run out and see if you notice anything. And then when they let it run out, it's like they're running back, you know, to mm -hmm. get some. Because within a few weeks, they're feeling, they're, they're, they forgot what it used to feel like, because it's so slow and steady. Photobiomodulation is like that. I'm sure you've been seeing that a lot too, is where people will be getting kind of this gradually get better and better. And then if, you know, if they're kind of uncertain, then we'll try to cut them back and then they'll remember, oh yeah, I forgot I used to have that, or I have this pain, or I forgot what that felt like. It's human nature. And, and I think just about everybody, you know, does that. Another one, uh, type two collagen for joint support, randomized double blind placebo controlled study. Uh, daily supplementation, again, well-tolerated, led to improved knee joint extension. So they're actually looking at range of motion in this case. 
in healthy subjects also demonstrate the potential to lengthen the period of pain-free strenuous exertion and alleviate the joint pain that occasionally arises from such activities. In other words, it's doing what those commercials uh, are saying that the non are doing. Not that they're not doing it, but it's doing it without any downside, right? So instead of Aleve or Motrin and that sort of thing, to achieve the same goals and pay a consequence down the road, you can get these same kinds of improvements and not pay any consequence, and in fact, reap a whole bunch of other benefits, which is like the polar opposite of, of drugging thing. The therapeutic efficacy of undenatured type 2 collagen in comparison to glucosamine and chondroitin. So this is what I was alluding to earlier. Although glucosamine and chondroitin treated, uh, treated, treatment group showed significant reduction in pain compared with pre-treated values, the efficacy was less compared with that observed with undenatured type 2 collagen, or UC2. And so that's those kinds of articles that made me switch, you know, as well as my observations. I mean, I always track stuff like that, especially if it's something new, or if I'm using a new formula. Like if I switch companies and I use a slightly different formula from using the same kind of ingredients, I still will track the first 50 at least, sometimes 100, but I'll track the first, you know, 50 or so people that use that, and I get feedback from them on a monthly basis. So before I switch to something, I make sure that it's at least as good or better. And usually if I'm switching, it's because it's at least as good, but it's less expensive. So that's, you know, usually why I'm switching around. And that's what I was getting at, too, with that joint complex. It's, it's really, really really uh, reasonable for, for what they put in that. Um, so we'll kind of get finished with the type two, you get the idea. But the safety and efficacy of the type two collagen and the treatment of osteoarthritis of the knee again, previously studies have shown that the type two collagen, UC2, is effective in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and preliminary human and animal trials have shown to be effective in treating osteoarthritis. These present clinical trial uh, evaluated the safety and efficacy of UC2 as compared to a combination of glucosamine and chondroitin again, and in the treatment of osteoarthritis of the knee. Results indicate that UC2 is more efficacious, resulting in significant reduction in all assessments from the baseline at 90 days, whereas this effect was not observed in glucosamine and chondroitin treatment group. Thus, UC2 treated subjects showed significant enhancement in daily activities, suggesting an improvement in their quality of life. That's kind of like you get the point, right? So over and over again, there's a bunch of those out there. Uh, that's the International Journal of Medical Science, 2009. Basically, from then till now, I mean, it's the same thing, just keeps coming out. And I've never seen anything other than positive findings from that stuff. So that's kind of a concluded thing. So uh, how um, accepted by, um, say, rheumatologists is, is this? Because my dad was just recently diagnosed with RA. Yeah. I've never heard of this, that his physician hasn't yeah. mentioned it. That's, um, there, there's three things that I see, three possible outcomes. So it depends always on who the rheumatologist is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they've either heard of it and they're encouraging it. Uh, it's rare. I have had people come in and that's on their end. They've already been given that by their doctor, by their rheumatologist in some cases. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those rheumatologists have taken post graduate like you know continued education in functional medicine or something mm -hmm. and so they're aware of it and they'll they'll they write, they write a prescription or tell them what to buy over the counter or online then there are others where the doctors heard of it but doesn't want to so, sort of step outside of the box you know the of the norms I guess and and go and go so far as to recommend it but when then people ask them they'll say yeah it's actually yeah, it's great go ahead and do that it's not gonna hurt you right Mm -hmm. And then there are others that will say as a knee-jerk standard response, as an ego protection mechanism, you know, there's no research behind that. That's the, when you hear that, I mean, it's amazing, right? Like how, I'm, 20 years doing this, I'm still jaw-dropped sometimes at the, mm -hmm. how often that comes up. And it's their way of saying, I don't know, right? I mean, that's kind of, in, in almost all cases, uh, they'll say, you know, well, there's no research to, to support that, or there, there aren't any studies, or now, sometimes that's true. Like just today, somebody told me that she asked her doctor about uh, apple cider vinegar for reflux. And her doctor said, there are no studies to support it, but I'd say do it because I've heard from hundreds of patients that it works. That's, a, that's good uh, doctor-patient communication, I think. Because he's right. You know, even if you have a thousand patients that anecdotally tell you it works and there's no risk, then why not encourage your patient to do it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when is there ever going to be a funded study on apple cider vinegar? Maybe when it brags funds it or somebody, <laughs> but there's no money to be made, right? So like, who's going to spend tons of money designing a placebo-controlled randomized trial on apple cider vinegar? You know, it's just there's no who who wins in the end other than you know brags. But you know that's the whole problem with with just completely relying on that. Now, 
there, we do know that there's no risk, and it's sort of you know been used. Those kinds, some of those strategies have been used since antiquity. So you could say confidently, we'll give it a shot, right? And if it, it doesn't always work, but it does for a lot of folks. With this, when any time like a patient of mine will come back and tell me that my doctor said there's no studies, I just give them a bunch of these studies, mm -hmm. and I'll say here, give it to your doctor, and then they see this isn't coming out of like Reader's Digest, right? So right. this is the, the, when they should recognize. And I'll usually put the National Library of Medicine, I'll print that off so it's on the heading. So when they see that come in their way, they automatically know, oh, this least should be interesting. I mean, it's from peer-reviewed literature. And then they might see it as from a rheumatology journal, <laughs> and then it's from 2016 or 2017 or whatever. So if they look even at the abstract and they get an idea of the study design, right? There was 150 people in this thing, these ages, men and women, age men, and it's all matched age and gender, say for the, for the placebo group. And these are the outcomes, then, there's absolutely no logical reason why any doctor wouldn't be behind that. Right. There are those that won't even look, right? And so, uh, and they're everywhere. I mean, it could be Duke or UNC or whatever, you know, place that carry more prestige, let's say. But they're, they're everywhere. I mean, I've had tons of patients come back to me and say, you wouldn't even look at it. Like, I, I handed it to him, he said, you know, I don't have time to look at that stuff. I mean, that's a bad doctor. I don't care. You know, what he knows or he she knows or whatever, that's terrible. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a really, to me, that's, you know, sheer stupidity on the part of the, the clinician, you know, to not take 60 seconds and, and take a look at something like that, but it is what it is. So that's kind of the best answer I can give you. It's all over the map. But the thing is, it, this removes opinion from the thing, right? I mean, it's not my opinion that these things work. That's why I'm showing you some of the evidence. There's lots more. We could sit here till five in the morning going through all these studies, but you know, you get the point and these are all from major reputable journals, right? So there is no opinion. I don't need my opinion. The facts are the facts. It does work, right? So there's and, there's, and it's totally safe. Have the pain management clinics done anything? Some looking at this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in a narcotic era. Right. Yeah. Though, have you, over you, yeah, overused. Yeah, it, it's few and far between in my experience, at least in North Carolina. I think if you go other places, like you know, I've talked to a fellow who's got a like a really big functional medicine practice in Denver, Colorado. I knew you were gonna say Colorado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, there. Uh, it's far more common, you know, whether it's like uh, traditional medicine or, you know, pain management, it's far more common to have some integrative kind of uh, approach like that. You know, places like California or Oregon, you know, places like that, it tends to be more common. North Carolina uh, is not so common. But we have our little pockets, like if you go to Asheville, you're going to find more, more <laughs> medical doctors who, you know, okay. who prescribe this stuff, you know, than, than, uh, than here. And here you're going to find more than you would in, say, Goldsboro or Rocky Mount or some of these other towns, you know. But, uh, and even in Triangle, like Chapel Hill, there are more and more medical doctors who are, who are encouraging this or writing prescriptions for compounding pharmacies to make this stuff. Wow. Uh, I refer to a few different doctors in the Raleigh, Chapel Hill area that, uh, that literally prescribe things like Metagenics, pure encapsulations, like the same, same products we use here. You know, and they just write that down and have them grab that. So it's getting there. But it's frustratingly slow, you know. I mean, I, I never really, being naive in 1998, starting out my first, my opening my practice, I wouldn't have thought 20 years later I'd still be, you know, having those conversations. I mean, that because the evidence has been around for that long for a lot of these things. So that's just more of the same stuff on type two collagen. There's more on curcumin. So turmeric, you know, it's like a ginger mm -hmm. sort of a root. Curcumin is the active ingredient extracted from turmeric. So most of the studies, some of them will say turmeric, a lot of them just say curcumin. So the same sort of a deal, this 2017 article, phytosomal curcumin, which is in that joint complex, that's the, that's the Mariva is the trademark of that. Um, the efficacy and safety of curcumin phytosomes, that's just the form that, that that's in, it's called Mariva. Uh, they've been shown against several human diseases, including cancer, osteoarthritis, diabetic microangiopathy, that's that damn small vessel damage, and retinopathy, which can lead to blindness, and inflammatory diseases. Uh, the Spice for Joint Inflammation 2016 article, uh, anti-inflammatory role of curcumin in treating osteoarthritis. Uh, and you can see in conclusion, curcumin is a potential candidate for the treatment of osteoarthritis. Uh, compounds with anti-inflammatory properties are potential treatment agents. Curcumin derived from curcuma species is an anti-inflammatory compound as such. There's another one 2016 on curcumin, alleviating the symptoms of joint arthritis. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. They're looking at a bunch of other studies that have already been done. And those are randomized clinical trials, so gold standard again. And that's a quote from it. There was no significant difference in pain reduction between curcumin and pain medicine 
in the meta-analysis, that, that's pretty amazing, uh, of five studies. These are randomized trials, right? This is their meta-analysis. In conclusion, these randomized controlled trials provide scientific evidence that supports the efficacy of turmeric extract of 1,000 milligrams a day or one gram a day of curcumin in the treatment of arthritis. I think that's pretty awesome. If there's no average difference in pain scores, then why would you take the drug? It doesn't make any sense to me that, that anyone would. 2015, role of curcumin in common musculoskeletal disorders. Um, I didn't have a little balloon on that one. Uh, review of current lab translational and clinical data. And so you can see, though more phase one to three trials are clearly needed, thus far the existing data show that curcumin can indeed potentially be useful in the treatment of hundreds of millions worldwide who are afflicted by these musculoskeletal disorders. So that's like arthritis, tendonitis, bursitis, fasciitis, and so on. Um, biological actions of curcumin on articular chondrocytes. Those are the cartilage cells. Articular just meaning the articulating joint. So it's the cartilage within joints. The available data from published studies suggest that curcumin may be beneficial complementary treatment for osteoarthritis in humans and companion animals. Nevertheless, before initiating extensive clinical trials, more basic research is required to improve its solubility, absorption, and bioavailability. Now that's 2010. Well, here we are in 2018 and we have Mariva. That's that one from that prior study, that phytosomal form. That is massively enhanced bioavailability and solubility, and that's why they came up with that. And so it says, once these have been overcome, curcumin and structure-related biochemicals may be safer and more suitable nutraceutical alternatives to the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that are currently used. We already have that, right? And that's in that one-a-day joint complex that I'm so, uh, so happy with and, and excited about. Um, Efficacy and safety of Mariva. So here it is. This is the curcumin phosphatidylcholine complex, uh, and that's what's in that. Uh, that's actually a, a patented extract or preparation. That's what's in that joint complex. Uh, previous three month study of Mariva, that's a proprietary curcumin supplement, decreased joint pain, improvement in joint function were observed in 50 osteoarthritis patients. Since it's a chronic condition requiring prolonged treatment, the long term efficacy and safety were investigated in a longer eight month study involving 100 patients with arthritis and their scientific or significant improvements of both the clinical and biochemical endpoints were observed for Mariva compared to control group. This coupled with an excellent tolerability suggests that Mariva is worth considering for long-term complementary management of osteoarthritis. To do photobiomodulation on its own is great. Putting these two things together is awesome. You know, like it's the, you're getting the benefit. What I perceive, and I don't have a study to show this, but I theorize that part of the reason photobiomodulation makes the Mariva and the other things work so much better is because of the enhanced blood perfusion to the affected area, right? It makes sense, because if it's in your bloodstream but it has a hard time getting to the target, then you're gonna have pretty moderate or mediocre results. But we know just like with the neuropathy case, like that case we were just talking about, you can visibly see the color change in this fellow's foot after seven visits. You know, imagine if, you're, if he's, we're trying to deliver something like in his case, alpha lipoic acid, you know, and acetylcysteine, things like that to, that help with the peripheral nerves, well, how's it gonna get there if, it can't, if the circulation is super compromised? So you know, one leads to the other, and that's why I see these as synergistic uh, therapies. So Boswellia is another plant that's been used since ancient Greece, at least, um, and Boswellic acids are the main component of that. Uh, it's kind of the same, like it's this, it's not the same, but it's similar action to curcumin. It's kind of along the same lines. Um, the, there are a variety of chronic inflammatory diseases which respond to treatment with extracts of the resin of the Boswellia species. These studies include rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, chronic colitis, ulcerative colitis, col collagenous colitis, Crohn's disease, bronchial asthma. It cannot be expected there is a cure from these diseases, but at least improvement of symptoms in 60 to 70% of the cases. Side effects and the number of severity of side effects is extremely low. The most reported complaints are gastrointestinal symptoms. It's the only one I've ever seen, and I could count on one hand how many times I've seen that in 20 years. Allergic reactions are rare. I've never seen it in my own practice. And most authors report that treatment with Boswellia is well tolerated and the registered side effects in Boswellia and placebo groups are similar. And that's another thing is people in the placebo group are reporting about the same incidence of side effects. So I've really never seen anything other than people say it gives me a queasy stomach or something like that. And it's temporary and most of them don't care because it works. So they just keep taking it anyway. But there's no, there aren't any dangerous side effects. The one caveat I'll say though, when you're, if you're using this stuff is if you're on a lot of, if you're on a pretty heavy dose of blood thinning medication, like um, you know, Coumadin, Plavix, and so on, then it's, it's not that you can't use it, but you either get, keep your doctor informed, and I, have, I always do that with my patients, and then if they're not really hands-on, 
I'll order blood work a few times, like every two, three months, and check their prothrombin time, INR, looking at clotting time, and make sure the blood's not getting too thin. Because there's a little bit of a blood thinning effect with these plant extracts, but there's not enough in that joint complex that's gonna have a major impact. But still, it's always good to be careful and always keep your doctor in the loop if you're doing these things. There's another double-blind placebo-controlled study of the efficacy of 5-loxin. That is a Boswellia extract. The 5-loxin is another kind of proprietary extract that's in that joint complex in one capsule. So you take one capsule a day, and already we've got the UC2, the Mariva, and we have 5-loxin. And this is just showing the same thing. It reduces pain, improves physical functioning significantly in osteoarthritis patients. It's safe for human consumption. 5-loxin may exert its beneficial effects by controlling inflammatory responses to reducing pro-inflammatory modulators. Those are those cytokines that we looked at. And it may improve joint health by reducing enzymatic degradation of cartilage. That's that pitting we saw, like where the cartilage is breaking down. It can pull the brakes on that too in osteoarthritis patients. So Boswellia serrata is the technical name, but 5-loxin is the sort of the proprietary extract from that, uh, from that plant. So that was 90-day double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study. So again, 75 people in it, you know, it's fully randomized, gold standard, and the results were super positive. 2016, so MSM is methyl sulfonyl methane and boswellic acids versus glucosamine sulfate in the treatment of knee arthritis. That's a randomized trial. And you can see these results are consistent with anti-inflammatory chondro, that's cartilage protective effects, previously found in experimental studies. This new combination of the integration of MSM and Boswellia, MSM is also in that joint complex, uh, that's presented good results and satisfactory in comparison with glucosamine. Until now, that's been the cornerstone of treatment in arthritis according to guidelines. So this is just another one. This is from 2016. So you're seeing this being replaced, it's changing of the guard, right? Glucosamine was the standard thing. That was a non-drug treatment and it worked great. But like I said, you had to take it three times a day or it didn't work. And that was a problem with compliance. And this stuff works better anyway, and you only need to take it once a day. So the, the compliance is really high. So that's kind of, to go along with the photobiomodulation, to make it work better, faster, longer term, that's why I use, that's how I found that formula. I always look at the new stuff when it comes out. A few years back when that came out, I looked at those ingredients, and you, know, and you just saw some, the sampling of the research. Every one of these things is packed into that one capsule. So you've got the undenatured type two collagen, the MSM, the Mariva, which is curcumin, the 5-loxin, which is the Boswellia, all packed into a single capsule. So almost nobody is you know, bad at taking one capsule a day. And so that's why I've been using that one so long. And just another one on MSM. Patients with osteoarthritis with the need taking MSM for 12 weeks showed an improvement in pain and physical function. <laughs> uh, the efficacy of MSM and osteoarthritis in the knee was another one, same deal just shows that uh, improved symptoms of pain and physical function during the short intervention without adverse events. MSM is like the same toxicity as water. I mean, so you'd have to almost drown in it to hurt yourself. Um, so there's the joint complex from pure encapsulation, single dose, and that's it. So you just see that you've got that 40 milligrams, remember in that one study, that's a standard dose of the actual UC2 with the registered trademark. Uh, you've got hyaluronic acid, which I didn't even mention. It's a minor player, but it's, it is still good. It's not great, but it's kind of nice to add that in there. It's really good for your skin, so a lot of people take it for that. Uh, MSM, Mariva, 5-loxin, uh, and that's it. No soy, it's just a cellulose capsule, no junk in it. They, pure encapsulations, that's why they call themselves that, right? There's no binders, fillers, excipients. They're capsules, not hard tablets, so the bioavailability is great. But that's why they put in things like Mariva and 5-loxin because the enhanced bioavailability of those things. That's a phenomenal formula. And of all the people that have come in to, to my office and have undergone laser therapy or photobiomodulation, that is one that I use a lot. Like I did a, that whole group of 40-some people that went through that 36-visit trial. Part of that trial, you know, they all got three bottles of joint complex or four bottles because some of them went four months. So every one of them, I have them on one of those a day. You know, to pat it. So sometimes when, when I've had conversations with other clinicians who are, get, who are using photobiomodulation and they're asking questions and like, how come your results are better than mine? That's why, because I add those kinds of things in, right? So if it's a neuropathy person, throwing things like alpha lipoic acid in there or N-acetylcysteine or glutathione for people that have been taking lots of loads of Tylenol over the years, they have other evidence of glutathione depletion. That's what we do here is we, we shore that stuff up. 
And the other reason is that, that we get better results than most people is because we use that, but also we try to watch out for deficiencies, and a lot of clinics aren't doing that. So people are just walking in willy-nilly, and they're getting BBM, but they have iron deficiency, or vitamin D deficiency, or B12 deficiency. These are common things. And so if they're not at least screened for, thought about, and, you know, and corrected, then you're not gonna get better no matter what your therapy is, right? Like photobiomodulation is like almost magical, but it's not actually <laughs> magical. So, you know, it can't really, you know, can't override these sort of deficiencies that people are walking around with. But that's the, uh, that's the, the one that's replaced all the others that I've ever used for arthritis. It's the only one I've been using now for years. I use that with at least a couple thousand different patients over the years, if not more. And it uh, and it works every time. This is the one that you have up front too, the joint yeah, complex. So like, like, out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you will get have it in a couple up. days. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too. They send it second day. So yeah. I mean, I usually just order that week by week. So we've already, you know, um, talked a lot about photobiomodulation. When you look at, you know, all of these different conditions, that can, that's a partial list, and it's very hard to talk about this in general public because it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds too good too good to be true, how can one therapy do all those things? But it does that fundamentally because it's inhibiting inflammation, it reduces oxidative stress at the cellular level, which is the kindling behind most inflammatory conditions at all. Which is also to say that the full body photobiomodulation truly, and I hate to even use the term, but it's anti-aging. I hate to use it because it's been so overdone, but it does push back upon the underlying, the primary driver of the effects of aging, which is oxidative stress. And so, to, to have a therapy that can get down to that level on a cellular level is, is pretty remarkable. And it does that really well, and that just so happens to be a major driving factor in so many different conditions, particularly arthritis. Um, so we see a few here, we'll wrap it up and I'll answer questions. Photobiomodulation of pain and inflammation in microcrystalline arthropathies, that's like gout, right? And so when you're looking at um, pain, if you're talking about the level of pain, and one of the most painful conditions known to man is, is gout, right? It's never fun to deal with. It's never fun to deal with as a clinician either. Um, and so to have this kind of a therapy that works really well, I still, I've only probably had a couple dozen gout patients uh, where I've used the photobiomodulation, but I have 100% success so far. Small number, maybe a couple dozen, but it works right away. Uh, and there's, there's good evidence here going back, this is all the way back to 2006 to show that it works. Their conclusion was that laser therapy represents an effective treatment in the therapeutic arsenal uh, for uh, these arthropathies. So these, this is on rats in this case, treated with laser improved, those without treatment did not improve. Both laser and non drug treatment achieved rapid pain relief with gout without significant differences again. So if the laser therapy is working as well as the non anti-inflammatory therapies, then why not use the laser? Because it's side effect free, right? So you get side benefits and it actually heals, like it facilitates healing and repair. So laser therapy was more effective than non drug treatment in patients with chronic knee and shoulder arthritis. And that's again, a very important point, right? Is that there's no logical reason to take the drugs if this works at least as well, but actually can facilitate repair and have long-term effect, and it outperforms on knee and shoulder arthritis. That's just reiterating the same thing. 2015, the action of pre-exercise laser therapy, which is now called photobiomodulation, on the expression of interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. Those are those super potent uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, I've shown this one before in the gist of the overall overview of PBM. And it just shows that laser therapy in conjunction with aerobic, this is literally walking around, like you can go for a 30 minute walk and satisfy your aerobic requirements to make these things synergistic. So exercise on its own drops in cytokines. Laser therapy or photobiomodulation on its own drops it. You put them together and, and it looks like this. So they used a young people as a control group because young people typically have really low levels of these cytokines. And then they used the control group, which is an aged population, and that bar graph represents the level of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Then you look at exercise. How much exercise drops that is pretty remarkable, right? Then you look at photobiomodulation on its own, and it's almost as good, but look at the combination of, like that's literally getting people to go for a stroll, you know, like getting people to walk for 30 minutes a day or something similar, ride a bike, or it doesn't have to be anything major. And, and you look at that combination, what I think is amazing is you're, all, you're not far above the control group, right? Which is the young people. So you could get people way up in years to drop their inflammatory responses pretty darn close to the young control group. And I might remind, just it's worth pointing out at this point, 
that as of 2016, there was this really pretty uh, groundbreaking study on supercentenarians and semi-supercentenarians. So those are people that are 105 to 109 and then 110 and older. And there was, I think, about 700 of them that they found in Japan to study. And they were looking at their telomeres. They're like little twist ties on the end of our chromosomes. And they, they, as the telomeres shorten, our, our, we're getting closer to the end. You know? So your lifespan is sort of mimicked by telomere length. And the study, the title of it was, Inflammation, Not Telomere Length, was the number one predictor of longevity into extreme old age. So the one thing they found is a common denominator in these people that were well over 100 and still functioning well is that they had low inflammation, right? They were able to attenuate that well. So that's a powerful tool when you think about it. You don't have to go, you know, to a CrossFit class or, you know, go do a Spartan race. You know, all you need to do is be somewhat mobile. I mean, it's not that, it's not that hard. Like taking a moderately paced walk for about 30 minutes a day will get you there or, or something of the equivalent nature. And you see that in combination. This is, is quite profound. This is just another guy, TNF-alpha. Same thing, the, the young people and then the older people in the combination of exercise and PVM, and you can see how close those are. That's, <coughs> that's hard to exaggerate that. So 2016 article again, low level laser therapy stimulates tissue repair. This is just kind of just to show you that again, it's not me saying it or it's not hypothetical. And it reduces the extracellular matrix degradation in rats with induced arthritis in the TMJ in this case. But you can do this in any joint, it's done in every joint. And TMJ is really easy to treat with uh, photobiomodulation because it's right there. It's easy to get to. And so you've probably been seeing with your large cluster there that, uh, that uh, I, I've been getting really, like, so I've been using this different sort of a high powered laser for the last two and a half, three years. And, and now I have the same laser that we have here. And the two, with those two different probes, my results have been through the roof, especially with that sort of thing like TMJ where I'll one or two or three visits and I have people that are you know, pain-free or almost pain-free is really, really fast. Um, and so that's just showing the same thing. And it can, it can repair the tissues, not just block the pain. And then we have ankylosing spondylitis. That's that bamboo spine I was talking about. It looks like sort of candle wax drippings on an x-ray. These results after an eight-week treatment, after follow-up, the combination of laser therapy with passing, passive stretching exercises decreased pain more effectively than placebo laser plus the passive exercises, the stretching exercises. So they used a real laser and they used a placebo red light and they did the same exercise, just stretches with these people and there's a, a big difference between the two groups. Um, and again, that's the only thing that can treat it. So nonspecific low back pain, that's a 2015 article. The nonspecific low back pain is hard to treat because you can't put, put your finger on anything that's driving the pain. It's like chiropractors hate seeing that walk through the door. It's the hardest thing, right? If you can't find the problem, it's just generalized aching of the back. First of all, you gotta rule out cancer and other pathologies. But if that's all been ruled out, success for chiropractic care stinks on that. And in those cases, it's not very good. It's not good at all. And sometimes, uh, depending on the doctor, it could be zero. Whereas uh, low-level laser is actually um, quite effective. Their findings indicate it's effective for relieving pain of non-specific chronic low back pain. However, there's still a lack of evidence supporting its effect on function. It doesn't affect function. It's like if you do laser therapy and take their pain away, it doesn't mean their back is automatically stronger, you know, or they have, you know, they have this performance enhancement. It doesn't do that at all, but it makes it so they can go get their back back in shape, so to speak. Um, so low level laser and conservative care of knee arthritis successfully postponed the need for joint replacement. So after a follow up, uh, so this was a randomized study of 100 people. They were unselected elderly patients with bilateral symptomatic knee arthritis. Each knee randomized to receive either treatment protocol A, consisting of conventional physical therapy, or protocol B, which had the physical therapy plus laser. Then they followed up in six years. Patients clearly benefited from treatment B with the laser, as only one knee joint needed replacement surgery, while nine patients treated with protocol A needed surgery. So it was nine times better, right? Than, uh, and that's, that's statistically significant. We conclude low-level laser therapy should be incorporated into standard conservative treatment protocols for symptomatic knee arthritis. And I couldn't agree more. So shoulder arthritis or hands or feet or spine, any arthritis. I mean, if you can hit the joint using photobiomodulation, then why wouldn't you, right? Like that's the thing when it comes to this stuff, I could not show you. And I've made a total effort because before I, you know, invested heavily into like these things are very expensive, you know, these full body pods especially, so before I decided to pull the trigger on bringing that stuff into my clinic, I mean, I tried to f make a case against it. That's what I always do before bringing in anything new, any kind of therapy. So trying to find evidence and mount an argument against it, you know, 
was impossible. I mean, there isn't anybody out there who can do that because there's no evidence to take away from this evidence of efficacy. There's nothing on the other side. You can go and look. You know, I'm not trying to sort of just present a one-sided uh, point here or a case here to be made. It just doesn't exist. You're not going to find these studies like these randomized placebo-controlled trials that are going to have negative outcomes and say it doesn't work or say that it causes harm. They don't exist. And that's why, too, the ultimate test, because you could look at what can you find on, online today where there's no negativity out there, right? I mean, like everything, you're going to see negativity. If you go and look on YouTube or you look up anything like that, video interviews of researchers and clinicians that study this stuff, you're not going to find any that are negative, right? which is that in and of itself is, is kind of saying a lot. Are these studies on the handheld? Uh, not, not the it, it's the same effect. So, but most of these studies, th there was no such thing as full body at the time. The reason that the full body application came out was because of all this stuff. And once they were able to show that you couldn't harm healthy tissue, then the thinking was, why are we doing like just a knee or just a shoulder? If, if it's safe to do, like if your normal healthy tissues aren't negatively impacted, why don't we just put the whole body in there, saturate it, so whatever needs repairing gets repaired. Right, that's, the, that's literally how, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it came to be. So they just had to demonstrate that that indeed was safe, right? That you could do it and do it lots without causing any harm. And if it's not gonna cause harm, then, you know, then the thinking is, well, why don't we just saturate the whole body, right? Because if someone comes in, let's say again, arthritis in their shoulders, what are the chances they don't have any arthritis anywhere else? I mean, it's close to zero, right? And if you take any person over the age of 40 years old and you take an x-ray of their full body, you're gonna find arthritic joints, everyone. I've never seen one anyways that didn't. And absolutely over 50 years old, right? And so we all accumulate that stuff. And so that's where that rationale came from, is take all of that and instead of, because we could do it by hand, but it would take an hour to treat somebody, or it would take even more than that to go like, you know, probe by probe di diameter, front and back, it just take forever. So the idea was put them into a pod and just saturate them, you know, full body. And then we still use the handheld for deeper targets to use higher intensity if we need to. But even in the older studies and new, it's almost always the same wavelengths. Yes, that's Regardless right. of the handheld, whole body. That's right. Same the technology. Panels, it used the same wavelengths. Yep. And yeah, because they found a long time ago that, you know, for that deeper penetration, it's usually about 800 nanometers, usually about 810 nanometers. And that'll pass more deeply into the tissues. And then you'll have like 900, 960 nanometers. It doesn't go as deep. It has different effects on surface like skin and stuff close to the skin. So those pods are running multi-wavelengths. And this pod actually has some others that are purely for the skin. Uh, the, the fellow who built it came from a dermatological laser background. And so, uh, so it's running five different wavelengths, but, but including that 810 nanometer. So you're getting depth of penetration and it's above you and below you, right? And your head to toe, you're in there. And so even the newer stuff, and this is uh, containing this more arthritis, but you know, we could go through the same kind of evidence uh, review for Alzheimer's and dementia and post-stroke and post-concussion and neuropathy and tendinopathy and first, I mean, we, the list goes on, right? And so it's the same principles you'll see over and over again applied to those different things, you know, but if the, you know, arth just sort of can keep keeping it sort of in control for time, you know, making arthritis the thrust for this evening, it's the same, you see some of that evidence and it's the same principles that apply. Last thing I wanna mention, and we'll, we'll, I'll answer any questions and wrap it up. This is a, an important point to make too, because if you're undergoing photobiomodulation, you might feel worse before you feel better. Right? And so this is the, the reason why, is that when you first start, you know, the low, the, back then they called it low-level laser therapy, the same thing. And this is just a summary from this article. So they're looking at experimental models here, the effect of low-level laser. But what they're saying is it facilitates destroyed cartilage cleanup. So you're gonna, you're gonna sort of phagocytize or, or mop up the debris, right? So like the, the sort of the damaged cartilage, the debris from that gets cleaned up first and that can ache a little worse first. Sometimes people even feel old injuries that they haven't felt in a long time, especially in the full body thing, in the pod. They'll feel like, you know, I had this old hip injury years and I've been feeling that again. You know, the first few visits, they'll sometimes report that and it's okay, it's normal, and it passes and then it feels better than it ever has. And that's the reason is that they show that it facilitates cleanup of destroyed cartilage and joints and then it stimulates fibroblasts, which are the cells that lay down the new stuff, the new cartilage, to synthesize collagen type three for repair. So I just like to point that out because some people will get scared off by that. They might get one, one or two treatments and their joints ache worse 
and they run for the hills. So we always, I always try to try to mention that it's if it happens, it's not unusual and it's not a problem, and it doesn't last long. But there is a known you know physiological basis for that, um, and it modulates pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this is after a partial tendon tear. So that's a 2016 article again. And those cytokines, what we talked about earlier, that's what drives that very first article I put up, that's what drives the degradation of that cartilage. And they're showing that the, the PBM or low level laser, it modulates those cytokines even after a tear of the tendon. And they say in conclusion, we believe that pulsed laser therapy worked effectively as a therapy to reestablish the tendon integrity after rupture. So they're looking at tendons like, like rotator cuffs that tear and it can heal that tear. So that's just that part that I just read. So you'll see these kinds of, that's a rotator cuff. You'll see a partial thickness tear and the effects of laser on it has anti-inflammatory effect over the injured tendons, decreased pro-inflammatory cytokines, decreased pain, allowing for facilitated motion so your rehab is easier. Like my mom after the knee replacement, you know, that's part of what made her recover faster. She could do her therapy better because she didn't have the pain. Didn't even need pain meds. Uh, and stimulates tissue growth factor release leading to cell growth, cell proliferation, which allows for the repair. That's the greatest thing ever, right? That's, the, that's just a summary of kind of what I've been saying multiple different ways. It's not just analgesia, although you do get that, right? And it's, and it's not just a halting, although you do get that, right? You halt that process, but there's actually some repair going on there. It's not thickening it back up again, like in terms of cartilage, but it's patching the cracks and pulling the brakes on that process. So you halt that process, you feel better, your life is better, you can move more, and that maintains integrity of your joints. You saw that the, the combination of simple aerobic activity, like, like a walk, 30 minute walk, what that can do in conjunction with that, and it's pretty profound, right? But if you're in a lot of pain, you can't even do your walk, right? And so it's with back, knees, hips, whatever. And so that's kind of what we try to do is bring as much as we can to bear that has huge potential success, you know, well beyond, well above 90% success rate that has zero risk and it's just to me it seems like the most obvious thing that should be done as a first course of action it really doesn't make any sense to me that the standard of care is still the standard of care it's not logical but it's profitable and so it's not logical to take drugs and then do surgery and if that fails then try this right which is what we see you know <laughs> over and over and over again and it's this weird sort of a mindset that's slowly changing where people are saying you know i'll do drugs for a while and then if I have side effects or if it hurts me, you know, then I'll do surgery. And if that doesn't work, I'll try this natural approach. You know, it's sort of bizarre when you really think about it. And there's evidence. It's evidence-based. You know, this is not a faith-based healing sort of a thing. We have evidence based behind all this stuff. It's not hypothetical. There's, it seems strange to think that photons of light can do this, but it's a fact that it does. And we have evidence now for many, many years, and thousands, 5,000 laboratory articles, 500 randomized placebo-controlled trials. 500 randomized trials in humans is no joke, right? I mean, that's, I mean, I'd like to see how many randomized trials to support most of the drugs on the market. You know, how many of those do we have for that? We don't have that. And the other thing that's crazy about the drugs is that it just has to be better than placebo to get approved. So you could have a 60% failure rate and still get approved because you're better than placebo. If we had a 50% failure rate, we'd be closed right now, right? I mean, there's the, you, you could never make it on word of mouth if you even had a 50% success rate. And that's still way better than a lot of the pharmaceuticals that are being used. So just to the end here, like this is a typical way that I typically would treat just in general. Um, three to six months I have up top, I changed it to two to six months because the results are faster, especially again, like using the combination of whole body plus handheld uh, for arthritic joints. I always do joint complex, one a day. And I, of course, I always do photobiomodulation. Um, typically to begin with, uh, like I'll typically start people off at three times a week, week for arthritic joints. But I will say that it's just because you'll get faster relief. It will work even at twice a week and work very well. It's just gonna take a little longer, right? To get you to sort of that threshold. But it's not like you have to be able to schedule three to make it work. So I'll tell people you could do two uh, or you could do three. And if you do three times, we're gonna, at least for that first, say three or four weeks, we're gonna get you pain-free a lot faster. But I've even done one a week with people that travel or the traveling salespeople, and it still works, just takes months you know, to get there. It takes a lot longer. Uh, so that's kind of like the, the core. Look, complicating factors or other things. Potential need for increased dose of MSM. So there's MSM in that joint complex, but sometimes if the, the condition's really severe and it's in multiple joints, I'll add, pure encapsulations makes just pure MSM capsules. So sometimes I'll add more MSM. You can't overdose on it anyway, and it can just enhance that a lot in the early days. 
Uh, sometimes I use resveratrol with the, and I'll use extra resveratrol and curcumin or turmeric, and I'll combine those for maybe the first four to six weeks, again, for speed, right? So if the person's coming in, they're in a lot of pain, I know they're not gonna give me that much time to get out of pain, otherwise they're gone, right? And then I feel like I failed them because I could have got them better if I would have gotten faster results because, you know, a lot of people are just gonna hang on for, for a long period of time if they're not seeing major things happen. So in those cases, I'll usually just put people on those two things for a short period. Omega-3 fatty acids, just for the sake of time, I didn't add those in. I could come and do a whole class easily on omega-3s and even just contain that to arthritis because there's, there's tons of research there too. But it's, it's the basis of our anti-inflammatory cytokine production. So everyone should be doing that anyway. There's a, just one gram a day or even one gram three or four days a week. That's a ubiquitous recommendation. We all need that. They're essential. That's an essential fatty acid. But people that don't do it and they've never done it, I'll add in omega-3s right away because again, it's fundamental. So the joint complex will do it without it, but it'll do a whole lot better with it. And everyone should do that anyways. It should be a standard. That's one of the few supplements that it should be in every person's cupboard, right? Like everyone, from children right on up. It's essential. That again, maybe we'll do another night just on omega-3s actually, because mm -hmm. that's a pretty fascinating thing. I could show you a bunch of research on that. It's pretty compelling. And then peripheral nerve inflammation or entrapment, that might you need, need manual therapy. So like, I don't know, I've had, well, how many Kelly have I treated by hand percentage-wise? 5% or of all the if people? If that. If that, probably less. Mm -hmm. So when I come up here on Fridays, there've been a, just a small number of people where I've had to add in a little manual therapy, you know, manipulation or some soft tissue work. It's a very small percentage of people, which has been really awesome. And, uh, and I've been finding that in my own practice that the more we've incorporated photobiomodulation, and especially with these kinds of conditions, arthritic conditions, we do that plus those targeted nutritionals, and then we do the, the littlest amount of manipulative therapy when needed, and people get better right away. I mean, how many, a few times I've come up here and treated people once, and they walked out, and it was like they, they just leveled up massively before they walked out the door, or it was like the next day. And that never happens. You know, I've been, I've been, I started off as just a regular old chiropractor, Right? Just using my hands on people. That does not happen. You know, that's, uh, it, it, it's, it's completely unique to this kind of integrative approach to these things. But I just want to mention that. That sometimes, let's say it's just again, for ease of example, it's just a knee. Let's say I had arthritic knees. And then we just, we treat with photobiomodulation all around the knee. But if there's an ongoing thing, it's like it locates itself somewhere. People will come in. It's just it's still right here. It used to be the whole thing. It's very often there's some peripheral nerve entrapment syndromes or some soft tissue adhesion, and that's where you know, typically I'll come in or whatever and try and figure that out. But just doing a little soft tissue procedures or joint manipulation of the knee even, will just put an end to it really quickly. So I just want to mention that as sometimes as a sort of a you know, complicating factor, or just might be special consideration. But by and large, we don't even need to do, add any of that. We've only had to do that for a select a few people. Uh, and when we have, the results have been really, really quick. So that was a lot. And so I busted through a lot of stuff, but uh, that's kind of it for tonight. But any questions from anybody um, about any of that or even other things at all? Can you uh, maybe add, touch on that? You talked about rheumatoid a little bit earlier, but maybe just explain a little bit more about the difference between the effectiveness and treatment for rheumatoid versus osteo. Again, just osteo, how it's treated. Yeah. So from a... PBM perspective yeah. and, and nutrition, um, there is really kind of the same as far as the way you treat it. So whether you know using photobiomodulation, you, it's the same application. You use the same settings on the lasers and the handheld, and of course you do full body. But it's um, it always takes longer. Oh, in, in my in my experience, like without exception, it's always taken longer when it's when it's rheumatoid. Yeah. Um, the wear and tear, you know, osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease, is always faster in, in my experience it's been that way it's easier because you don't have as many extenuating circumstances so what i mentioned earlier rheumatoid is autoimmune so you always have that component right your immune system's attacking your joints so in that case i'd still treat everything the same i use the same kind of joint complex i use the same photobiomodulation approach same uh, application sites same settings on the laser and so on uh, but I would tell a person with rheumatoid to, to change their expectations for how long it should take before they see major liftoff in their progress. But also there are more laboratory tests to do. So it's uh, for, for the, the best quality of care, you know, to try and you know, use as many tools at our disposal for rheumatoid, you always want to look at environmental triggers. 
you know, with autoimmune conditions, whether it's Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the most common autoimmune condition in the country, like 30 million Americans have that. Uh, and you're looking at rheumatoid arthritis, you know, different types, whether it's psoriatic or uh, lupus, or scleroderma, Sjogren's, these are all sort of rheumatological conditions. You ideally want to look for environmental triggers, whether chemical triggers that will trigger the immune response, because then it goes, the heightened immune response is going to heighten the attack against you, right? If it's your own joints being attacked. And food is a very common one. So uh, the vast majority of people that I've ever seen, which are thousands of people with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, in almost every case, we do blood tests to look for food antibodies because there's a huge correlation between autoimmunity and the so-called leaky gut. So-called, it's just, that's the colloquialism, but it's technically just a hyperpermeable upper intestinal tract. So if things are leaking through that shouldn't get through, um, that can cause autoimmunity and cause even rheumatoid changes. Or if they develop the rheumatoid for other reasons, say genetically predisposed and environmental triggers set it up, like chronic stress even could set that off, then you're going to develop a hyperpermeable gut. You know, so no matter how it starts, that's almost always going to be involved. So uh, we always look for those things too. And we do that here. I'm doing a lot more of that than I would have ever expected to seven or eight months in. Uh, you know, it's kind of strange actually. I mentioned that to you last week. How many autoimmune conditions we've seen here in, in just such a short period of time. I don't know if there's something going on in Greenville or, <laughs> or, or what, but, um, but we really have. I mean, for the, the number of people, it seems like every time I come here almost, uh, if not probably every time on Fridays, uh, there's somebody that we run into that has that component. So um, yeah, so we end up doing some lab testing for that too. Because otherwise, the best you'd ever get if you were doing photobiomodulation and some basic nutritional support, you could get really great results, right? Where a person is, you know, has wildly reduced symptoms and a, and a dramatically improved quality of life. But if there are triggers in play that you could identify and get rid of, and if we fail to do that, then they're never gonna be able to stop coming here to have any kind of quality of life. So some people say, I don't care, like the fellow in my office who's going once a week for the rest of his life. He's already budgeted, you know, because he, he was one of those fellows he did once a week for about six months, and it's been extraordinarily life-changing to him. You know, he was literally debilitated with arthritic, with arthritic pain, mm. and now he's not, and he's not using his canes anymore. He's up and down stairs and stuff, and so he's so thrilled with it, he just plans to do it once a week for the rest of his life. And I do it once a week too, and I don't have any symptoms. So I do it as sort of a proactive thing. But people with rheumatoid, if we don't at least look for those other triggers from the environment and, we, and address those if we can, then they're gonna be um, to, dependent upon this kind of therapy to stay reasonably well. Whereas if we could find those things and fix those things, they're gonna be able to go at least very long periods between visits here for like a maintenance sort of thing. So I've got rheumatoid patients that only come in once a month. I have some that come every other month and they're maintaining you know, top quality. And, uh, and that's not bad at all, right? That's a minimal investment of time and resources. And, uh, and it's just you know, sort of a win-win all the way around. So that's the big wrinkle with rheumatoid versus osteo is that you wanna look for these other circumstances, other triggers from the environment, food, you know, environmental chemical triggers, and like common household cleaners, things like that. There are blood tests for this. But when you find it, you pull that out for a long period, like six months to a year, then very often they can reintroduce those things without any issue because you can repair their barriers, the gut barrier, the blood-brain barrier. These are really off, they're very commonly compromised in people that have those autoimmune conditions. So, uh, so yeah, to get the best results, that's why we do that. That's why I'm even involved because like you're ordering labs and interpreting labs and designing a protocol, you know, to remove these things and use these things like our therapies and certain targeted nutritionals that's how we get better results than most people, really. And I mean, I know that sounds arrogant to say, I don't mean it that way. But that's why we do it that way. Because I mean, that is, you know, the be I've, I've been taught by the best, you know, and I constantly seek continued education updates from the people out there who are the best at what they do. And I never came up, I've never had an original idea in my life. And all I do is I take what's best out there and we try to apply it in, in the best possible way. So rheumatoid is a whole other issue, really, because of those environmental components. That would be another good one to do is a thing that I could come back and do a, ta a night just on rheumatoid, right? Because we could do, uh, I could do a series on rheumatoid, but we could just do a single night on rheumatoid and then I'll show some of those labs and explain why we do them and what they mean. And so for people that have autoimmune, not just rheumatoid, I could just do an autoimmunity. And, uh, and then people that have those things that haven't even heard of these labs, 
kind of to your point earlier about you know how come more people aren't recommending things like UC2? It's a great question. My opinion is they should because we see the evidence there. And it's the same thing with autoimmunity. A lot of people aren't even aware that these tests exist. You know that there are lab tests that you can use to delve at underlying triggers from the environment that are driving this this uh, this problem, which is not just quality of life in that case. When you're talking about autoimmunity, it can be life threatening. Right? So it's a pretty heavy situation. It's a big deal uh, to get that into a silent state. There is no cure for autoimmunity as of right now. Uh, but the name of the game is to get it in remission. You know, to put it in a silent state and then ideally keep it there for the rest of the person's life. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, always the goal. And, and we can do that in a lot of cases. Yeah. Do you see these patients able to get off of the methotrexate or biologics? Mm. Methotrexate, yes. Um, a lot of a lot of people when they come to like this office or, or my other my office in Goldsboro, they'll write on their intake. That's why they're there, right? I just had just had another every Monday night. I do a little like just a little free introductory class for people that are kind of kicking the tires in my office. Want to come in and see if we might be able to help them, so it doesn't cost anything. And they come in and ask questions, and I just give them an overview of all the different therapies that we do there, including these things. And you know, I just had another one this Monday night, and she and, and I had one last Monday night. Uh, one person in each one, and that was at the end. She said, "I'm here because I'm on methotrexate. Doctors are telling me there's no other options, nothing else they can do, and my life expectancy is not great on methotrexate, and that's why they're there." So, when people are coming in with that as a goal, right? Because it's not within my scope of practice. I can't tell people I, you you need to get off your methotrexate right now. I can't do that, right? But people come in and they say, I want to. Is there any possible way I can? You know, that's when I'll, I'll try to find some other solutions. And very often we can. It's, it's certainly not 100% of the time, but it's certainly at least 75% of the time that, uh, that people can come in and we'll, we'll use these therapies and we'll do some, you know, some targeted nutritional therapy. But then I look at those labs and if I can find environmental triggers that are, that's driving the condition, then my my success rate goes way up. So like if I can find those things and we pull those out and I just show them how to do it, then they have a very, very good chance of doing that. So yeah, I've, I've seen lots and lots of people over the years that have been able to get off those things. The biologics are different. You know, people on Humira and Remicade and that, the only time I've ever had people coming in looking to get off those, of course, is because they're not working or they have some major side effects that they can. So they, it's not even an option anymore. And therefore, they're very often just, well, you're on methotrexate, that's it. Right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people look online and they see those, they see the side effects, or they read up on Wikipedia or whatever on methotrexate, and it freaks them out, rightly so. And so then they come in just sort of as a Hail Mary pass, you know, they're just looking for any possible alternative. And um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's always, it's one of those things like, I can't remember the last time a person came in with a rheumatoid condition that didn't do better. I mean, it certainly happened, but it's been years. I mean, almost everybody gets better, but sometimes it's not that much better, and I'm really disappointed even when they're not. Sometimes they're, they'll say they're 25% better, and they're happy because that's a lot less pain or more activity, but I still am really disappointed. And that uh, doesn't even happen that often. You can at least usually get their symptoms knocked in half. You know, and sometimes we can put them all away in a silent state like that. And I've seen, even recently, a person with alopecia areata, Right? It's an autoimmune condition, their hair is falling out in chunks, grew back you know, very quickly. We've seen eczema and asthma and allergies, their atopic disorders have wild improvements, you know, especially with that full body photobiomodulation. And so there's immune modulation and all these things that play into that. So, And there aren't any studies on that stuff. It's just that you know, it's things that we, we've observed and so people come in with it. We know that there's a possibility it'll help. We know that it can't hurt, so like, let's just do it, right? Like, why not do it? And we see those things uh, often it better than even when we don't expect them to. And so, uh, yeah, I think very often people are, even if they're on the medications, they're doing pretty well, they're not great. So a lot of people come in and then they're doing great and they're still on their Humira or whatever the case. And that's fine, right? If they're tolerating it, it's working well. But a lot of people, they'll say like, well, I'm way better on the biologic, but you know, there's still room for improvement. And so therefore, you know, we can get them up that extra level without even, you know, without them having to do anything different with their, their medications. So I think the, the therapy of the future that's already happening now, just not in the United States, is the intravenous stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells. And I think the most successful area is autoimmunity. 
So <clears throat> eventually I think that'll get here. It's just right now not here and it's very expensive. And so like, you know, people are flying down to Panama City to be treated for $30,000 uh, for rheumatoid conditions. And the success rate's really high and there's never been a negative outcome. But uh, we just don't have access to it just yet. But even when they do, the, the, the synergistic impact of photobiomodulation with those stem cell therapies is going to be great. So, you know, I think that there's still that, that combination of therapies is going to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a long time before there's anything as good or better than photobiomodulation. You know, it'll be, I think, a very long time. It's never going to go away because it's just too good, right? I think that it's, it's always going to be incorporated more and more into the standard of care because you have something with no side effects, no contraindications, and this huge upside. You know, and this wide variety of benefits. It's truly regenerative. So, you know, it's, it's kind of one of the best kept secrets, kind of, I think, right now. Or, or it's not really a secret, but it's still one of the least known uh, therapies in terms of when you look at that level of impact and the number of people in the general public who know about it. I mean, you know, we're still very early in that, uh, in that arena. But a lot of, the, a lot of uh, orthopedic surgeons and... Um, and rheumatologists are starting to find out about it and they're, they're, they're getting pretty excited about it. I think you've had a lot of referrals mm -hmm. here, a lot of referrals from yeah. physicians. Uh, and so we even had an orthopedist, an orthopedic surgeon come down here, get treated and went back and, and he bought his own PBM equipment. He's starting up his own uh, therapy because he did one visit and his tennis elbow was gone. And as a surgeon, that's a pretty big deal, right? And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, and, and I, I talked to him at length and it's amazing to me there aren't more and more forward-thinking, you know, orthopedists, uh, orthopedic surgeons like that. It's, but they just don't know. A lot of them don't know. So I wouldn't want an orthopedist operating on me with tennis elbow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. That's like, yeah. They're, they're going to be at least somewhat compromised. And I look at the number of doctors that I've talked to over the years that are surgeons that stand there, you know, for hours and hours. It's incredibly difficult. I mean, like neurosurgeons, you might stand there for eight hours mm -hmm. straight with really tedious work. I mean, I couldn't do that. I mean, it takes a special person and a skill set to do it. And the, the idea that they're, they're suffering while they do it is, you know, is, is crazy to me. Because, yeah, it's, it's going to potentially compromise their, their outcomes. But also, it's not necessary. You know, mm -hmm. to, there's simple solutions to this stuff. So I think it's more like this, just this, in the short time this office has been in existence, I mean, I think already, you look at the word of mouth that's, that's getting around and the fact that it's, uh, that it's supported by so many medical doctors in this community is great. That's certainly not the case in, in my community. You know, there's a lot less interest from, you know, from the medical profession in my neck of the woods than there has been here, you know, which is not that surprising really. <laughs> but uh, this is a little more, uh, you know, progressive, uh, medically progressive anyways. And you have great hospital system here and, and really good healthcare in general. But uh, I think we're gonna see that more and more of that is, is popping up amongst different practitioners and so on. Any other questions on any of that? All right, well, thanks for coming. Thank you.